Welcome to the Mentis Podcast. Today we have Adrian Smood with Lifestyle REI. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me today. Well, you're the mobile home connoisseur and uh, you know focused on buying mobile homes. Uh, I guess your particular niche is buying the land with the mobile home, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but to kick it off, you know, with all the 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 different uh, current events that we have especially as it relates to inflation and, uh, you know, interest rates and uh, bank runs that we're, we're seeing come through uh, recently. How does that impact the mobile home space? You know, honestly, I kind of ignore all of that. Uh, I'm a buy and hold investor. Now, if I was fixed and flipping, that wouldn't make a difference. But because I buy for cash flow, none of that really concerns me because okay. I'm looking at the cash flow. And most of my properties are not bank financeable anyways. Uh, I don't use bank financing, even if it is bank financeable, but I'm in the person to person world. Okay, so, so you're I, using hard money lenders or um, maybe a direct lender. What type of rates are you seeing right now? Have they gone up or has it kind of remained constant? You know, this is something that's kind of ironic. My rates have gone down with my private money lenders. Okay. I've gotten a few different reasons. Uh, I've proven more and more of myself and, you know, we, we invest in different people, but another reason is mobile homes are mainly in the recession resistant, you know, the housing provider, lower end space. And I have some friends that are looking to diversify and they want something that they believe is going to make it through the recession. You know, if we're in the recession, when we are, if they ever make it an actual definition of that. And they're looking for diversification. So I've been able to actually get lower rates uh, recently. I, I never would have expected that, but, you know, things okay. happen. So, so you're, things are going well. I guess interest rates are going down. What about construction costs? Are you just baking that in up front when you're looking at your renovations? How are you, you know, making sure that um, you're not getting impacted by, you know, the, the changing climate? Yeah, that got me uh, last year. Okay. I did not realize how much some materials had gone up. I would say that I always look to make a really good return. So when I have those mess ups, I go from a really good return to a good return. I don't okay, buy so thin deals. Really good, twenty five percent. Yeah. Okay, so down to good is that twelve percent. Yeah. The, so twelve is actually the lowest I've ever gone into buying a mobile home. Okay. But the land was a really big lotto ticket in the path of progress and acre. And my coach even like, he's like, this is not what you buy. You buy better deals. And I tried to explain all of that to him. Now it ended up being better than a 12% return. It was a sure. newer construction. It wasn't like the one that's behind me. If anyone's watching, I'm not taking a 12%. I'm a 30% on something that's falling apart Okay, because there's a lot more risk there. So it sounds like you're doing a lot of one-off individual deals. Um, it's a, Maybe explain what is your different investment criteria for, you know, I guess for your your growth plan. Well, I look at the mobile home space, like you mentioned earlier, I'm in the single unit with the land. So not the mobile home park and not just the unit where we're renting the land. I own the home and land. It's a real estate transaction. And I kind of separate that out into the 1960s and 1970s construction. Those are not good construction. It was kind of the wild, wild west. The government really didn't have any uh, criteria of what they had to be built out of. It was toothpicks, I call it. Then we have the 1990s and newer. And obviously the 80s are kind of a mix of the two. So if it's in the 1960s, 1970s, I've bought a lot of those. A lot of investors are scared of those. I want a really good return on my money. 25% is the minimum I'm going to look at. I really want more than that. A lot of those, the land is not massively valuable. So I need a 30% return. I cannot get hurricane coverage. I have bigger risk there. There's no financing traditionally. So I have less exit strategy. There's a bigger risk there. So these are reasons I actually have to get a better return. Okay, so let, let's clarify here. You're saying 25, 30%. Is that cash on cash or is that? IRR or like that's, overall that's all in that's a, okay. assuming I have no debt all in money that's what I want so obviously if I use some debt 
from a friend or the owner of financing, my cash on cash is definitely going to be higher. Okay. So you're, you're looking for this all in. Does that mean you're buying, holding, and then selling at some point in the future? I don't ever plan to sell. I like okay. to buy and hold. But yes, I do kind of trade up my portfolio. When something becomes vacant, I reanalyze that property. How well is it performing? What is my equity? How much am I really making on my equity? And then is it a headache? If it's a headache, nowadays, I'm kind of selling that off a lot of times on owner financing to another investor. And then when I buy something newer, that's a little bit nicer or a better construction, uh, you know, a lot of it's headache to me. If the property causes me headache because it attracts a tenant resident that's going to call me a lot, if it's a low construction property that is going to be breaking a lot, you know, a headache is when we have to work. And if property causes, causes us to work, we don't want it anymore. Okay, so I get all that. As far as picking these properties, then, it sounds like you're pretty involved on, you know, selecting whether or not you're going to have a higher return or a lower return, whether it's a 1960s vintage or maybe it's a 2000 uh, somewhat newer property, you'll maybe accept a little bit lower. I guess, how are you building a team around you or what are you doing? Like what uh, systems are you putting in place so that this is scalable? Well, I have an office manager now. I never expected to have one before, but she kind of grew with me from just answering the phones and it it's really worked well. I'm able to benefit her family and her life. And she really manages most of the property stuff. So the day-to-day, -day, you know, we have a pretty good just system that we have built that we don't get a ton of phone calls. We look for very long-term residents. And then as far as finding them, I can tell really quick on a lead if it's something in the ballpark. And that really is just from experience of time. Before, yes, I used to have to dig in. I'd spend hours. I just put it in a quick Excel sheet. Look at the numbers. Is it even in the ballpark? I always give an offer regardless. You know, it could be a backup offer at 50% what they're asking. But it's numbers. And we know numbers don't lie. You know, the part that wholesalers and other people don't like about me is like, I do that. And then I have the headache value. And there's no percentage on that. It's just, is it look like it's going to cause problems? Is the area, you know, a red on the old Trulia when they had the, the accurate crime map? I'm looking at those things and I, I know my market. So I buy within 30 minutes of my house. So I'm not buying all over so I can understand my market pretty quick. Okay, so you're really, you're focused locally. That sounds like you're going to be the landlord then on top of this. And maybe that's what your office manager is handling now. Are you handling all maintenance requests as well? Yes. And by that, meaning you submitted a request and then we say, all right, call this contractor. And now you're responsible to connect to the contractor and to put it all together. And then you both send us pictures, the contractor and you, and then the payment goes out. So we're kind of outsourcing a lot of the work to the resident that lives there. And we give them a really fair rent for taking care of the extra work. Okay. So... I guess going back to the scaling, uh, you know, part of this, if if you're looking to, I guess, grow this right around your house, uh, you know, I'm assuming this is like you're just combing through listings all the time. How can you take it and maybe you know blow it up and 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 get you know a hundred thousands, you know, uh, more units? Well, I don't need that many, honestly. So. Okay, so this I, do, is, I see what you're saying. I take that back. What would you recommend if somebody wanted to do that? Maybe it should be the better question. I understand like some people just okay. want a lifestyle thing, but I guess what are you seeing with like this, you know, how could some people scale this or what are operators that you're seeing yeah. out there doing? If here? we want to 10X this, you know, go Grant Cardone on sure. this. Yeah, I would definitely have my teams in place and it's not massively different than any single family. And but everyone has to understand mobile homes, especially understand those two kind of ages of classes. You do need to find the right contractors. Any contractor can work on a mobile home and it's not massively different for them to learn it. Some just don't want to learn it. And imagine. they don't want to do a lower quality product. So that is a, a tiny bit of a challenge. But you would manage them the same. There, 
I actually have some site built homes, the traditional house that everyone buys. Uh, I have a master lease on those. So I rent it from the owner and sublet it out. We manage those the exact same way as we manage our mobile homes. Like and the if mobile you look at making you more. Yes, they're making me a lot more. So I need less of them. Okay, so you're kind of seeing the mobile home as the opportunity that people are walking away from just because of the, I guess, stigma around it or the difficulty with the lender and the contractors and potentially even zoning blocking you from, you know, rebuilding if it was, you know, torn down. Or yeah, down. no, that's a great point because so I'm in Central Florida in between Tampa and Orlando, and I don't do business over in St. Pete, but St. Pete, that county does not want mobile homes. They make way more dollars on taxes with high rise buildings. So if one burns down or a hurricane takes it, you can't replace it. So it. There is that challenge. Now in that market, it's pretty easy. You buy it for about land value if you can even find them there. Cause again, they're trying to get rid of them and you sell it to a builder whenever you're done. I see what you're saying. So you're almost looking at these as like cash flowing land. Yep. Anyway. Good. Okay. Yep. So when you piece things, okay, have you looked at piecing these together and putting together a larger parcel or are you still kind of, uh, you know, buying one off, you know, parcels? I, I don't know. It seems like it would make sense if you bought like five in a row or 10 in a row or uh, maybe a whole block or something. And eventually you kind of exited and sold all of them at once to a bigger uh, redevelopment plan. You know, I have looked at those properties where I'm at today. I'm not um, very strong and look going that direction. I did look at a package of 12, not too long ago. The bigger reason I didn't like it is I didn't like the area. It was a high crime, low income area. And I would have bought that four years ago. I wasn't in the same position today. Today, I'm not looking as much of that headache, we'll say on that, but it was a good buy. You know, you had to go in and just like any multifamily, even though these were all individual lots, it's exactly what you're describing. You owned three quarters of the road. It was a dead end road. So you had a lot of control there, but they all needed to be brought up. Value add, clean them up, make them a little bit nicer, not the slumlord style. That's who was managing it. And then you could also bring the rates, the rents up slowly, but you would control three quarters of the road. I liked that part of it. Yeah, I can imagine. So personally... I relate to the single family resident that's going to live there. Uh, in general, they want like more privacy and not services. And in general, a multifamily person wants some services done for them. And that's why I have found that I just relate to the single family person. They're just like, I'll take care of it. You know, give me some privacy. You don't have to right. spoon feed me with everything. And there's I'll a need for both check. sides of it. Yeah. It's just my personality. I got you. All right. So I'm curious on like the construction front. When you have a, a project that, you know, maybe like the one that is sitting behind you, it's in, uh, let's call it um, disrepair. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, you're it needs you're a lot so of kind. Yeah. So as you fix them up, how much are you seeing your taxes kind of jump up? Or is this kind of like sneaking by, um, you know, without major tax increases? I could see that potentially being a a potential win for you guys? Very good question. So few people ever ask me about that. Our taxes usually stay pretty dang low. Our property taxes, uh, this one here, I mean, we did fix it up. Uh, we own this one. And I think the property taxes are like 300 a year. It's something ridiculously low. So you went from 300 to what after you fixed it up? 300, it, it didn't really raise. <laughs> See, that that's that's something that I have not heard about, uh, you know, and like that is a really unique uh, thing to this particular segment of real estate. I mean, taxes are one of the major expenses in almost all other types of real estate. And I could see the assessment office kind of just writing it off because it's not uh, sexy or it's not downtown or uh, it's just a mobile home. But then that's huge to the bottom line. Yeah. I mean, is that consistent across every single type, every time that you've, you've renovated? No. So that's why I, I did want to bring that in. One that we bought last year is in 1999 on an acre of land. Again, path of progress. Sure. That one did raise. I think it went up about 800 or maybe a thousand for the whole year is what it raised. A lot of that was because it was a owner occupant 
long term, they had really low tax property taxes, and it got reported for about double is what we purchased it for. So the yeah, new so purchase price, price is what went in there in the property appraiser. And that is the main reason I believe it raised. Yeah, so it doesn't sound it wasn't like a drive by thing. Yeah, the, the construction didn't trigger it. It was the the price. Purchase price. Interesting. Yeah, that's a that's a unique um part of this. Now as far as 2000, you know, if you're buying something that's probably 2000, some of these mobile homes look pretty nice. I mean, they almost look like regular homes from the outside, you know, in some, oh, yeah. in some cases. I'd assume that those are the ones that are probably getting higher tax increases, but maybe something like that 1970s, you know, kind of, even if you fix it up, it's still kind of uh, looks like a trailer in a way, you know, kind of, um, you, know, you can do some nicer gardening and stuff like that. But it, at the end of the day, the assessor's maybe not coming out there and, and hiking it. Exactly. And to go with that, though, is the older ones are going to sell for less because there's not the bank financing. It's an investor paying cash or their owner financing it from the owner or private money or the highest price those usually sell for is an investor owner financing it to an owner occupant. But there's still a much lower price point than anything in the 90s, the 2000s and newer. So the the price doesn't get triggered as much, you know. Okay. Yeah, that see that's I mean that I mean, you're making money. I mean that's that's at the end of the day, you you know, if you're able to have a nice property that you don't need to go and uh, spend a ton of time with maintenance and somebody's paying you consistently every month, that is that's the real estate business model right there. Um and, and another of, to, I was uh, gonna say to go with that though, uh let's touch on insurance. So insurance is another area that we save some money. Uh I do self-insure some properties, especially the one behind me, because there's not really a lot of value there. I always keep uh, liability insurance, a million dollar policy on every property. That costs me 11 bucks a month. But as far as hurricane coverage or fire, you know, a tree falls on it. Some I have coverage on and some I don't. I do choose to self-insure some, but even the ones that I get coverage on, let's say without hurricane, I was still paying about 40, 45 bucks a month for insurance. Remember, we have a cheaper price point, you know, so that's part of it. Yeah, percentage wise, you know, that it, it's, it kind of shakes out. But still, I mean, if you're, I guess these investments are to the point where you're like, you know, if it goes away, you know, or if it, you know, goes, uh, goes up in smoke, you're, you're kind of just saying, all right, well, at a minimum, I still have my land here and I can just sell it to someone else and some builder could come in and, build a house and, and be done with it. I, I can see where the self-insurance uh, could could really save quite a bit uh, over a portfolio. Especially I, for an experienced investor. Someone that's growing only has a handful of properties. I think that's pretty risky. I didn't start doing that until I had a good amount of a portfolio. I keep some properties free and clear in case we need to you know, pull some money out of that because we just had one get destroyed by something. But overall, uh, that's works for me. I sleep well at night. You know, insurance is, sure. I think, mainly about how you sleep. See, that's the, you know, that's the stuff that you get to look forward to as you continue to you know, scale and, and you have years in. Uh, and I'm glad that you're taking advantage of it. Uh, speaking of things that people don't typically do early on, and that's I, I author a book. And you are, I guess, now a best selling author on Amazon for how to buy mobile homes. I guess, tell us about the process of writing that and why, why did you document it? Is it for investors? Is it for um, just kind of giving back? What, what kind of really spurred on uh, all that effort? Well, I like to do things that I'm not good at. I like to do things that are hard and people don't expect. I was in remedial classes all through school. So I was like, I'm going to write a book one day. Like not during school, like years and years later, like no one would ever think I'd write a book. I like that. And really that was just on that crazy bucket list. I was listening to Hal Elrod. He's one of my favorite people to listen to. And he was promoting a self-publishing school, which is one of his buddies. And I, I truly respect anything he promotes. And it hit me at the right time. I'm like, I do want to write a book. And he's giving me someone that can coach me through it. So I hired them. I mean, almost immediately. And they coached me through it. Now they changed all their programs and stuff now. So I don't know if they're doing that direct coaching. I already believed in coaching because... I have multiple coaches 
So I just knew it accelerates the path. And it was a wonderful experience. Uh, the cover was actually more challenging than writing the book, especially <laughs> for someone that was in remedial class. I found out actually while writing the book that I'm dyslexic. Uh, I texted one of my elementary school teachers because uh, I still know a bunch of them. Hey, is there a chance I'm dyslexic? And she's like, oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me that? She's like, well, we didn't really know back then. You know, the, all these terms and stuff weren't out there. Um, anyways, the book was written through the first, the filter of education. Second, um, to tell people about my education, the, my courses and stuff. And then third, to make money. People that think that authors make money, it's very few. The cost of doing everything, unless you just write it yourself, publish it, and don't hire anyone to help edit and do everything like that, it's not a money thing. Uh, I wanted to get that information out there. I wanted to pass on like education that I got from my mentors. And it was a fun process. I learned a lot just by writing it. And I wrote it in a story format of my career while teaching about real estate. Well, that's certainly, uh, you, you know, I, I, I think that's a, that's a unique answer. I appreciate you being so candid and honest about, you know, the challenges that you faced. And, you know, I think it's, it's really awesome that you, uh, you got it, you got it down on paper and and now it's out there for the world. And uh, I guess that, that really ties back to the marketing and, you know, getting uh, investors or getting people to know about your properties or know who you are for book sales. What are you doing uh, that's different and kind of cutting edge in today's market? Why well, wear a neon yellow shirt all that the time? That is no doubt one of the first <laughs> things I noticed when we jumped on this video call. So and it was kind of one of those that you just try things and then something works. It started as a greenish color shirt and it said, My wife buys houses and mobile homes. And it ended up being coming my brand for buying. And it says, My wife buys mobile homes. And it ended up being a neon yellow because some print something just told me we can't print the neon green, but they could do yellow. So I was like, sure. And it has made it easier because it's like the construction color. So I can find everything everywhere, but it fits my personality is a lot of it. So I'm a networker. I get most of my leads through networking. I go to meetings and I say, I buy mobile homes. Someone comes up to me afterwards every time why would you buy mobile homes? They go down in value. There's only trailer trash, blah, blah, blah. And I say, you're right. Send me all your leads. And they have, I've always paid people and kept them in the deal. Realtors, same thing. You know, they're getting a commission on the purchase price and mobile right. homes are lower purchase price. So they want to help people, but they can spend their time making more money. Indeed. Became an information source. So I'm a networker. I just, tell everyone I'm loud. I like attention. Then when I started the education side, the lifestyle REI that I said, all right, let's just keep the same kind of brand I'm already known for. Everyone in my masterminds said, yes, keep the, the color, keep the shirt. And it, again, it fits my personality. An extreme introvert is probably already shaking right now. Like, no, I can't do all that. Cause you have to just find something that fits your personality. I love marketing and just marketing yourself and i use social media it, it's a fun fun topic for me all right well uh unapologetically you and keeping it simple is kind of kind of what i was hearing there is um uh, you know honestly i've never heard somebody say i wear bright color shirts but it makes a lot of sense i i was i've been staring at it the whole time that we've been talking and uh you know your brand is getting imprinted um you know into our minds here so it's it's a it's like kind of that keep it simple stupid you know it's just it, it doesn't have to be overly complicated sometimes and i i appreciate the uh the insight on that uh, as you grow you know go forward i i hear that you're you're it sounded like you were just alluding to it you're you're mentoring people now kind of on the lifestyle rei side and you know what does that look like well i'm mainly doing educational classes courses sometimes sure. i teach in person Sometimes I just have my courses online. I'm not doing direct coaching. And that's because it's not part of my life vision. Like I want to be able to like turn my phone off for a week, a month, and not feel guilty that I have someone I have to help out. 
Um, so I just, I'm not emotionally mature enough to be able to do that. You know, one Fair of enough. my coaches, he can do it. He, he'll tell us, he's like, phone's going to be off for the next two weeks and he can do it. I would be like in Europe, like, oh man, does Nick has a closing? Like, is, is he going to be okay? Does he need some help? So I don't do any of that because I, I filter everything through personal. I do some one-on-one calls, but it's as go. It's really to share what I have, what's worked for me, what hasn't worked for me, uh, to help make it cool to not be perfect. I see so many people have gotten caught in the analysis and have to be so perfect. I'm a recovering perfectionist myself. <laughs> and I just want it to be acceptable that we don't need to know everything to get started and to go, go, trip, ask for help, go, go, ask for help and build it as we go. And, and then give back, you know, I've got a lot of my mentors that they haven't recorded all their stuff. And I'm like, we got to get their information passed on or it, it dies. And then the last piece of it is I have a lot of friends that run awesome, successful real estate businesses, but they don't want to get in the educational world because it's, it's a business. So I said, hey, if I just give you like three hours and you just come teach, that's it. You have to do anything else. Will you do it? And they said, yes. So I want to be a platform to get even more people's expertise out there for everyone to learn because everyone has a different thing they want to do. And I just love education. It's helped me so much. And I want to help other people get the same thing. Certainly inspiring. I think that a lot of people uh, will benefit from hearing about real estate investments. I think that uh, you know, younger professionals need to look at alternative investments for, for the long term. You never know if Social Security would be there, you know, 50 years from now, all these, you know, you can get into the, um, you know, what if scenarios. But at the end of the day, just putting good decisions, uh, piecing good decisions rather together over a long period of time always is a successful story. And Adrian, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some of those, uh, you know, some of those uh, insights with us. If people want to get in touch with you, where can they reach out and uh, and find you? One of the best places to go is Adrian S three six zero dot com, and it's basically a landing page. It has links to my book, to my all my websites, any events I have coming up. Uh, all of it's there. You can shoot me a message. Uh, I try to reply through messages more than actual phone calls because of that lifestyle thing. And I'm happy to help. The other thing I I do want to mention is part of my vision and passion is is helping the youth and teaching kids about money. I think that's something that our parents' generation didn't fully pass on. So I do want to encourage anyone that is decent with money, good with money, help the youth understand it just a little bit more. It's much easier for them to grasp it and make a life change than it is for us once we're already in that wheel of life so uh, i just want to encourage people to help out the youth so we can get money education back out there couldn't agree more with that it's certainly getting it back into schools and uh not being afraid to talk about it and um, getting books and you know attending classes are always a great way to um, make that happen and again i appreciate uh your time and certainly we'll we'll look to track your uh your success and hopefully we'll we'll be in touch soon you're welcome thank you man Thanks, Adrian.